Geography is extremely important in the story in the Gospel of Mark. Um, the first half of Mark happens in Galilee, the top part of Israel there. I know that map is a little small, but you just have to take my word for it. I don't know if you can see the word Galilee, but Jesus is out on the countryside ministering to the people in the first half of Mark. In the second half, chapters uh, 7 to 16, Jesus moves towards the capital city of Jerusalem, towards the people in power to confront the corruption there. That's when Jesus gets arrested, put on trial. That's when Jesus is sentenced to death on the cross. And then obviously the resurrection ends the Gospel of Mark. And so it's important if you're reading the whole, the whole Gospel of Mark, you see this shift in geography and that it's very important to the story. Today we're still in the first half of the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus is traveling among the people on the countryside. He's sharing the good news. He's sowing the seed of God's word and he's spreading the kingdom of God. People are meeting Jesus. People are having personal encounters with the long-awaited Messiah. People are experiencing firsthand the power of God in Jesus Christ. As Jesus heals them, as Jesus forgives them, as Jesus teaches and preaches to the people, he is bringing the power and presence of God to them, and lives are being touched and transformed. An exciting part of the story. The first seven chapters of Mark is not only about Jesus ministering to the people, but something extraordinary is happening, something very striking. As Jesus is encountering people, they're being separated into two groups. There's the first group, the people who accept Jesus, right? The people who listen and believe the good news, they repent, they change their ways, and they follow Jesus. That's group one. Another group starts to form, it's the people who reject Jesus. They react to him with fear and confusion. These are people who are threatened by him, often religious leaders, and they are threatened by the good news and they plot to destroy Jesus. Being encountered by Jesus Christ causes people to either be attracted to him or repelled away. That's still true today. In scripture, Jesus talks about separating the sheep and the goats, right? He talks about separating the wheat and the weeds. This is a common theme, encounters with Jesus and how we respond splits us in to one of two camps. Now, as you hear me say all this, which group do you want to be in, the insiders or the outsiders? Uh, the yeah, the insiders, thank you. Yeah, I do too. I want to be included in the kingdom of God. I want to be a part of Jesus' posse, right? I want to be in Christ's click, don't you? You want to see how many more alliterations I can make? <laughs> Those are the only two I came up with. I, I want to be part of the kingdom of God, and you do too. And the key to entering the kingdom of God is this. It's how you respond to Jesus. That is the key. Everyone is invited, right? Everyone's invited into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The invitation is huge. Jesus wants everyone to come. And Jesus is very direct. He's very clear with his instructions. It's not confusing, right? He says, listen to me, understand, believe, repent, right? Change your way, turn back towards God. Take up your cross and follow me. He's very specific. This is what I want you to do. So listen, I want to read, I, I read that parable to you, and Mark, I want you to re hear what happens afterwards. So Jesus said, let anyone with ears to hear, listen. When Jesus was alone, those, were, those who were around him, along with the 12, asked Jesus about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may look but not perceive, they may listen but not understand, they may turn again and be forgiven. Or <laughs> they may not turn again and be forgiven, excuse me. And Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower says the word, those are the ones on the path where the word is sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And this second group, these are the ones where it's sown on the rocky ground, and they hear the word, and they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root, and they endure only for a while, and then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately fall away. And this third group, these are the ones, those are sown among the thorns, and these are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things comes in and chokes the word, 
and it yields nothing. And then this final group, the fourth group, are the ones that sown on good soil. They hear the word, they accept it, and they bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100-fold. As Jesus is explaining the parable to his disciples, we get to overhear it, right? We're on this end. We get to read it here in the written word in the Gospel of Mark. So we're on the inside, right? We get it. We have looked and we perceive. We listen and we understand. We turn again, we repent, right? And we are forgiven. We're on the inside. It's pretty awesome, All right? We get to enter the kingdom of God. We know Jesus. We understand Jesus. We are right with God, yes? Yeah? I wish it was that simple. <laughs> it's not that simple. <clears throat> In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples, the insiders, the ones who have the secret to the kingdom of God, they don't always get it right. They don't always act like they understand what's going on. They are very inconsistent. Sometimes they get it right. It's pretty awesome when the disciples leave their nets and follow Jesus. Good job, guys. They did that one right. It's pretty awesome when he sends them out two by two on a mission and they heal and they preach and they touch many lives with the power of God. There they got it right. But they also get it wrong. Sometimes um, the disciples get it wrong, like when Jesus calmed the storm, it said the disciples were scared and they lacked faith. Do you remember that? And when Jesus walked on water, it said the disciples were overwhelmed and they were terrified. They didn't understand, they said, who is this? Right, so again and again throughout the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are confused and they're overwhelmed and they mess up. So what the heck is going on with the disciples? Because when I read this story, I relate myself to the disciples. I feel like, yeah, I'm rooting for the disciples, I'm one of the disciples, and then I see them mess it up and get it wrong. What do I do with that? Well, honestly, I find this very comforting. I really do. The disciples are depicted as real people with flaws and with hang-ups, and I find them very relatable, very authentic. They're not presented to us as perfect people by any means. And so I can see myself in their contradictions. I desire to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to do the right thing, to be loving, to be patient, to be generous, and yet, like the disciples, I fall short. I make mistakes, and I know that I'm not worthy to follow Jesus Christ. But in the end, in the gospel, the faltering disciples are forgiven, and their fractured relationship with Jesus is restored. So here's the takeaway message. There is a clear warning in the Gospel of Mark for you and for me not to get too smug in our walk with Jesus. We need to be on guard against the sin of pride, the feeling that somehow we're superior to others, that we're self-righteous, that somehow we're more deserving of God's blessing because we are not. We need to stay humble, admit our faults and our failings. We need to be willing to learn and to be open and flexible like a child would be. That's, Jesus said the key to entering the kingdom of God is to be like a child, uh, to have that openness and that humility. Salvation is a gift of God's grace. You cannot earn your way into the kingdom of God. You don't have to be perfect to receive God's love. I'm gonna say that again. You do not have to be perfect to receive God's love. I don't have to be perfect to receive God's love. I need to hear that. Do you need to hear that? So let anyone who has ears to hear, listen.